The Senate Transportation Finance and Policy Committee will come to order. Today is February 22nd, and we do have a quorum um, on the line. We'll, we'll have start with the roll call. Chair Newman. Present. Vice Chair Zinski. Here. Senator Dibble. Present. Senator Carlson. Present. Senator Howe. Present. Senator Johnson Stewart. Present. Senator Kent. Senator Kiffmeyer. Present. Senator McEwen. Senator Osmick. Senator Osmick. Present. Senator Pratt. Present. Senator Kent. Again, a quorum is present. We have three uh, bills on the agenda today. Um, um, Mr. Chair, um, I'm also present. Uh, Senator didn't... Coleman is present. Thank you. Um, Three, Senate, three bills on the docket for today. First Senate file is Senate file 3081, Senator Newman. So uh, my understanding is we're going to sort of simultaneously do the second bill along with the first. Hence, Senator uh, Howe is there for Senate File 3086. They have a lot of similarities, so uh, we'll kill two birds with one stone so we can go home and shovel snow. Uh, to the first file, Senate File 3081, Senator Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you are correct. There's great similarities between uh, Senator Howe's bill and my bill. So. I've, I've asked the Senator Howe to just join me uh, at the testifying table and um, uh, we'll go through our respective bills and then uh, uh, there are a number of folks who are here today that would like to testify regarding this bill. Uh, in a nutshell, Senate File 3081 uh, is a bill that uh, would transfer 100% of the auto parts sales tax into HUTDF. Uh, the uh, existing law uh, is as outlined in Senate File 3081 with the exception of that one change, that uh, instead of a, a set amount as it currently exists in, in the amount of a little over $145 million in the fiscal year uh, 22 and thereafter, uh, we would be switching 100% of the uh, auto parts sales tax into HUTDF, and the, the, the difference would be uh, twofold. In the first uh, year, um, I'm going to say the fiscal year uh, 2023, um, no, I'm sorry. If we, in fiscal year 2022, if we shift 100% in, instead of having 145 million plus in the first year, we would have th a little over $303 million plus. And the other difference is, is that not only would we have an increased amount, but uh, with the uh, ensuing years, in the or in the out years, uh, that sum would increase because we are dealing with a percentage rather than a fixed amount, and it is anticipated that the amount of the sales tax will increase over the years. Um, you have heard me testify many times about uh, the need to find adequate funding sources for our transportation system in Minnesota. And uh, I, I, I remain in the firm belief that uh, our transportation system in Minnesota is underfunded. I believe that in particular, uh, our state agency, MnDOT, is underfunded. Uh, and we simply have to recognize the fact that 
we not only have this underfunding, but we've got a real problem coming at us with respect to the gas tax. I've testified before, I believe that gas tax is a, is a, a dying star. Currently accounts for approximately a third of the money that goes into HUTDF every year. And uh, with uh, electric vehicles coming and uh, internal combustion engines being becoming more efficient, uh, we simply have to recognize the deficiency that's going to be caused. So the idea here is to, is to uh, transfer some additional funds into HUTDF in the near term uh, and uh, uh, that isn't going to be the end of the story, but it is a start. And we have a number of uh, folks involved in a coalition that has been put together consisting basically of folks in the trades and uh, business people who are very solidly behind this proposal. And I think that uh, if we put some more money into HUTDF and spend that money on roads and bridges, number one, we are going to generate economic development in the business community, and number two, we are going to have uh, a significant amount of uh, good construction jobs for the trades. And uh, I see nothing but good that comes out of both of those uh, ideas. So that is... Uh, uh, like I say, it's a, it's a, not a new idea, uh, but I think it's an important one. And uh, uh, Senator Howe's bill is a bit different from uh, uh, Senate File 3081, uh, but I would, uh, I would ask that members uh, please pay attention and, and listen to what Senator Howe has as to the differences between the two bills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So it's a little bit unusual that we would have two bills flying uh, in the same glide path, uh, but we'll go to Senator Howe, and then my plan will be to start down the testifiers list. So those of you who want to speak to either one of the bills or both of them, you can come up and do that. There are some online people, and uh, try and efficiently go through, and then we'll get to the last bill. So Senator Howe to Senate File 3086. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And members, uh, Senate File 3086 uh, is very similar to uh, Chair Newman's bill. The differences are is uh, the way it splits out the money. Uh, it actually takes 76% and take, puts it into the HUTDF fund, takes 12% and puts it into the small cities assistance account, which is and then a another 12% into the town road account. Now, right now, the townships get about, they get 2.65%, 2.675% to town roads, and they get 1.525% to town bridges. Uh, and that hasn't been keeping up. It does grow every year, uh, but it, it doesn't keep up with their requirements. So this would actually give them, instead of, it, it would actually give them a boost. Uh, and right now, small cities, which are uh, the greater majority of the cities in my district, get no funding on an ongoing basis. And I think that's the biggest thing that we, we face here is Local towns and the townships and the small cities do not get enough money to keep their road network up. And that's really where it's farm to market, uh, especially in the townships. Uh, in small cities, they, pay, they buy gas also. None of that money comes back to their small cities to improve their roads. Their roads only get improved by property taxes. And that's the only way, unless they come for bonding money, uh, that's the only way that that works. So members, it's this, uh, this is a very important piece. I mean, taking, all, taking that money from the general fund for, for transportation is key because everything that we buy, everything that we get comes on those <laughs> roads and bridges. 
And it just makes sense that the general fund helps support the roads and bridges that we, we get our products from. And this is a this makes sense and this, this works. So uh, members, right now the 12% for the small cities and the town road account would amount to in fiscal year 23, about $37 uh, million, dollars, thir just about 38. So uh, I think it's, uh, it, it would uh, actually put about 238, almost 239 million into the HETDF for distribution. So members, I'll start working through the uh, testifiers list and then we'll come back to questions for either one of the bills. Um, on Senate file 3081, the first testifier I have is, is Tim Work, followed by uh, Jason George. So, Mr. Work, please introduce yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, committee members, uh, good afternoon. My name is Tim Warkey. I am the executive director of the Associated General Contractors of Minnesota. And we are a construction trade association uh, in existence over 100 years. And we represent the construction businesses that um, build, construct, and maintain uh, the state's uh, infrastructure. Let me begin, Mr. Chair, by thanking Senator Newman um, for sponsoring this important legislation. Um, we uh, are part of a coalition of business and construction businesses and labor coming together in support of this bill. And we're united because we unite together when we, when we work on project job sites, but we're united at the policymaking level as well. And we uh, often come together in support of each other, and we think this bill uh, follows uh, that pattern uh, specifically. Long-term structural investments, as Senator Newman is putting forward here, are important to our contractors because it allows them to make business planning decisions for future market opportunities and also to anticipate and scale the workforce demands and workforce supply that's necessary to deliver this type of work. Efficient and economical delivery of construction services is reliant upon predictable and stable funding sources. To illustrate this point, as an example, the recently completed I-35W project in downtown Minneapolis took approximately three years to construct and was very disruptive. Portions of that project were executed in the winter months and the, involve, and the project involved uh, exceedingly complex staging uh, and traffic accommodations. But without predictable and stable funding uh, that the Department of Transportation is relying upon, that project probably would have taken much longer and would have had to been staged uh, in a much different manner, resulting in uh, much more inefficient delivery of the necessary investment. As Senator Newman indicated, when we look at our state's current investment strategy for transportation, we're not on a sustainable path, and the gas tax revenue uh, is suspect and at risk for diminishing returns as we move forward. We support dedicating the auto parts sales tax as one of several long-term solutions to putting our state's road and bridge investments on a better and more sustainable path. The construction industry is well positioned to deliver a much larger capital investment program than is currently sustained by existing resources. We have the country's safest and most efficient workforce, and together, working with our partners in labor, we've uh, been able to have a strong proven track record of being able to deliver excellent value for taxpayers. So Mr. Chairman, in the interest of time, thank you for the opportunity and would stand for any questions. Are there any questions for this testifier? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next uh, testifier, Jason George. Um, individuals are testifying. I think I'd like to sort of set a little goal of three minutes or Roughly, um, just so we've, I, I do have 11 people on the list and we've got one ad additional bill and plus questions. So if we can try and keep it to about three minutes, we'd, I'd appreciate it. Mr. George, please introduce yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Jason George. I'm the business manager, the elected leader of the Operating Engineers Local 49. 
with 14,500 members. We're the largest construction union in the state, and our members build and maintain the infrastructure in Minnesota. Um, thanks for your ch chance to be here. Thank you, Senator Newman, Senator Howe. I uh, just want to go on record. We strongly support both of their bills. Um, in particular, wanted to touch on uh, the dedication piece of this. Um, a few years ago, uh, we supported the effort with our business partners who are here today with us again um, in the AGC and the Chamber and others uh, to get the first 50% 50, 50 of the auto part sales tax dedicated to roads and bridges. Um, that has been a tremendous success. There were projects that MnDOT was able to build because of that dedication that they wouldn't have otherwise. Um, that coupled with the, the one-time investments of cash and bonding that have been uh, happening for the last five or six years under um, you know, support of both the House, the Senate, and the Governor um, have been tremendous for the industry. We've been able to get a lot done. Uh, and there's a one-time investment at the federal level that obviously happened that will help us as well. And, and I think there's broad agreement to get matching funds here on a one-time basis in this state. But long-term, this, kind of, this is what we need. We need different sources of revenue that are stable, um, that grow over time. And the auto part sales tax uh, is one that just makes common sense. And capturing the rest of it will allow us to build more projects. Um, I would say, you know, we have, uh, when we did this the last time, we heard a lot about uh, the general fund and how we were rating the general fund and that the sky was going to fall. Um, we have a $7 billion budget surplus, I believe, or $6 billion, something like that right now. Through a global pandemic, uh, I don't think it had much of an impact. And I believe that this will not either. Um, in fact, when you put our men and women to work, they pay quite a bit of taxes and actually will grow the general fund the more of them that you put to work. They make family sustaining wages with pensions and health care and, and all of that. So uh, we think this makes good common sense. We are well positioned, as my counterpart, uh, Mr. Worky, said, to staff up. We have the infrastructure in place to train. Uh, if you all uh, provide the cash and the money and the investment, uh, we will get the job done. So we're here to ask you to do that, and uh, we thank Senator Howell and Senator Newman again uh, for bringing this proposal forward. Are there any questions for this testifier? <coughs> Seeing none, thank you, Mr. George. Next on the list is Chris DeLaForest, a former representative who is here in the Senate. So. Um, Please behave appropriately, Mr. DeForest. <coughs> the other body has bad habits. Please introduce yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, good afternoon. I'm going to need a, an etiquette refresher after the uh, <laughs> lockdown here. It's been a while. Uh, again, for the record, Christopher D. LaForest, today representing the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters, representing over 28,000 <coughs> carpenters, millwrights, pile drivers, and floor covers over a six-state region that encompasses the upper Midwest. Uh, we're proud to be here today uh, with our brothers and sisters in the trades and our partners. As you heard from Mr. Worky just a moment ago in the industry and this important legislation. I'd also like to note as well our many thanks to both Senator Howe and Senator Newman for their steadfast support for issues like this, which are not only good public policy, but certainly put our members to work. Mr. Chairman, keeping in mind your admonition to keep remarks brief, I'd like to share with the committee <coughs> three facts that I think are relevant uh, for today's bill. One, as most of you probably know, Minnesota has the fifth highest number of public roadway miles in the country. We're number five, which makes a lot of sense when you consider that uh, Minnesota is primarily an ag-based economy. You need a lot of road miles to get goods to market. Second, the Minnesota State Highway Investment Plan has identified nearly $25 billion in unmet road and bridge needs over the next 20 years or so. So while bonding dollars are very much appreciated and critical and federal dollars are appreciated and critical, the need goes on and the need is significant. I don't think anybody disputes those numbers or the fact that third, the American Society of Civil Engineers has not been kind to Minnesota's infrastructure in giving our bridges a grade of C, which is the good news, if you will, and our public roadways a D plus. And so when you consider all those things, you can understand why the Carpenters Union stands with our coalition partners in supporting uh, these two bills you have here before you in uh, delivering what is a very, very important uh, core function of government, and that is good quality, efficient, safe roads and bridges. Mr. Chairman, I hope I made my three minutes. It was great to see you, and I'd be happy to stand for any questions that you may have. Well under three minutes. Any questions for this testifier? 
Seeing none, we'll move on to the next testifier, Bentley Graves. Please identify yourself for the record and begin your testimony. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Bentley Graves. I'm with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. We represent 6,000 employer members across the state in all industries, all sizes of business, all corners of the state, and through that represent uh, about half a million employees in, in Minnesota. Sustained investment in the state's transportation infrastructure uh, has always been a cornerstone of the Chamber's uh, policy work, and that's because businesses depend on a safe, reliable, and efficient transportation system to get their goods to market and their employees and their customers to their door. And just to, to provide some context of this fact, uh, take these stats from, from colleagues of ours down at Greater Mankato Growth and Mankato Chamber of Commerce. Mankato has the highest rate of retail spending per capita in the state, more than every other metro area. This highlights the fact that they draw consumers from the surrounding areas. The same can be said for Mankato's draw as an employment hub. It's a daytime population increases by 40% each day. And when it comes to the movement of goods, more soybeans are processed in Mankato than anywhere else in North America. But in Mankato, just like everywhere else, all of this activity is supported and made possible by our transportation infrastructure. But investments in our transportation infrastructure can also spur economic growth and development. Our colleagues at the Owatonna Chamber of Commerce, along with their representative in this body, Senator Jasinski, um, are quick to point out the fact that completion of four-lane Highway 14 between Owatonna and Dodge Center brought significant new business investment to the area. More than $130 million in investment from new businesses coming to the area, and more than $20 million in investment from the expansion of existing businesses. These statistics from just two communities across the state, Mankato and, and Owatonna, highlight the importance of continued investment in our state's transportation infrastructure. And the bills the Senate Transportation Committee is putting forward today will ensure our ability to continue making and improving our system in the years ahead, maintaining and improving our system in the years ahead. We've been strong supporters of using the revenues from the statewide sales tax on auto parts for transportation purposes. Uh, going back to 2017, we were pleased with the work the legislature did then to bring a portion of these funds into transportation. But the fact that the current dedication is set in statute as a fixed amount significantly limits the usefulness of this revenue source over time. By bringing 100% of these dollars into transportation, we'll broaden the base of financial support for the system with a source of funds that will continue to grow over time, helping us keep pace with continually rising construction costs. Similarly, as you'll hear in a minute in Senate House 1602, by taking steps now to ensure that electric vehicles contribute to the upkeep of the system in a way that's commensurate with the financial contributions made by drivers of gas-powered vehicles, we'll ensure that as the size of the EV fleet grows in coming years, we have a mechanism in place to make the kinds of investments in the upkeep and maintenance of the system that will continue to be necessary. I want to thank Senator Newman, Senator Howe, and the committee today for bringing these bills forward, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Are there any questions for this testifier? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Graves. Next on the list is Abby, she's online, so I'll let her pronounce her last name. I don't want to butcher it. Abby with the uh, Asphalt Paving Association. Uh, could you Good. please unmute yourself and identify yourself for the record and begin your testimony? Yes, thank you, thank you Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Abby Breiduck. And as was mentioned, I'm chair, or I'm not the chair. I am the uh, executive director of the Minnesota Asphalt Pavement Association. Um, I apologize for not being there in person. Of course, the weather has kept me in the West Metro. Um, but I wanted to share some comments with you about our support for um, these, these, these uh, pieces of legislation. You also should, should note that um, not only do we have business and labor at the table, but you also have another contingent of sometime rivals in asphalt and concrete agreeing today on these bills. So please take note. Our association membership strives to advance asphalt technology from small dri driveway pavement operators to large construction companies um, by making investments in our state's transportation network. Long-term solutions like, these bill like in these bills are important for our membership so they know there will be a future for these projects, not just from a workforce perspective, but also from an innovation per investment perspective. Um, we, we are ready in the asphalt industry to rise to the challenge of this increased funding. One Minnesota paver recently shared with me that they've already hired an in-house HR recruiter to identify new avenues to find employees. 
Um, of note is that we anticipate women and minorities will make up a large percentage of our new workforce. And we also anticipate that many of these new hires will most, most likely won't have any experience in the construction industries. Uh, but we're committed to training and mentoring these folks. In fact, our association has responded by creating an industry training program for new hires for this purpose. Another approach to the labor solution is being more efficient by leveraging technology, investing in new equipment, and creating a culture for innovation. But we can't do these things, uh, as has been mentioned, without making, making new investments in workforce and innovation without sustainable and dependable funding. We all know that the Infrastructure Investment, Investment and Jobs Act will bring in a lot of dollars to the state, but it's a complex bill and we know the funding is temporary through 2026. The kind of sustained funding in Senator Newman and House bills is what we need to not just make new future investments, but to make those investments more efficient, effective, and safe. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Are there any questions for this testifier? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, next on the list is Matt Zeller. We've heard from asphalt. Now we got now we got concrete. Please identify yourself for the record and begin your testimony. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, community members. My name is Matt Zeller. I'm the executive director of the Concrete Paving Association of Minnesota. Similar to AGC, we are the second oldest concrete paving association in the country, so we've been around a while. We represent 70-some uh, member companies ranging from aggregate to cement suppliers all the way to consulting engineers. Um, and again, these are the folks that produce the vast majority of the concrete pavements in the state of Minnesota. Thank you for allowing me to testify here today. First, I'd like to state that CPAM supports the bills being uh, introduced here. The funds collected from these bills will go um, a long ways towards guaranteeing sustainable funding sources so that we can focus on long-term solutions rather than short-term band-aid approaches to our aging highway system as has been done for the last couple decades. Additionally, the new federal IIJA funding will go a long way towards allowing our state to more consistently focus on long-term fixes which will best benefit the state both economically and environmentally, but this funding only goes so far and we need greater needs are met, <clears throat> need to be met, excuse me. As we focus on long-term and sustainable funding fixes, um, these typically cost more and will have a better return on investment and these dedicated funds will go along towards meeting that effort. Consider that several upcoming high profile projects um, in the Twin Cities such, or around the state, such as the Blatnick Bridge up in Duluth, the I-494 corridor, I-94 between Minneapolis and St. Paul, or the 35W-494 interchange project, as well as out of numerous out of uh, metro projects that are critical. Several of these projects alone can consume the entire MnDOT annual budget, and that doesn't factor in inflation, uh, further reducing how far our funding can go. The only way to get these projects built is to have sustainable funding sources which allows us to build long-term fixes and benefits the taxpaying public best. The most economical fixes will usually be the longest lasting fixes, but to do that we need guaranteed funding sources in order to afford to build uh, those projects. That's all I had. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are there any questions for this testifier? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. And the final on the list of for 3081 30, is John Thorson. Please identify yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is John Thorson. I'm legislative director for Lyuna, uh, Minnesota, and North Dakota. Uh, we're Minnesota's infrastructure union, representing more than 13,000 uh, skilled construction laborers, along with our brothers and sisters in the construction trades, uh, build and maintain our roads, highways, bridges, critical utilities, and allow our communities to thrive. Uh, Minnesota's transportation infrastructure needs are great. Uh, 
far, far greater than the resources available to put into them. Uh, with over 660 <coughs> deficient bridges and nearly 5,000 miles of our highway uh, rated in poor condition. Uh, I'm here today to support the dedication of all sales tax collected from auto repair parts uh, to addressing our transportation infrastructure needs. Uh, these investments uh, will make Minnesotans safer, uh, boost our economy, and create family-supporting construction careers. Uh, in fact, tens of thousands of Minnesotans have entered lifelong careers through registered union apprenticeship programs um, like ours and the, other, and the rest of the trades. Um, these programs are what the construction industry relies on to produce safe, skilled, and efficient trades workforce. Um, registered apprenticeship programs support critical efforts that increase participation of women, people of color, veterans, and others that are not fully participating in our economy. In fact, the socioeconomic impacts of a career uh, that pays middle class wages uh, provides comprehensive health care and retirement benefits and offers opportunities for training and advancement can exceed those created by lower wage, no benefit job by a factor of five or more. Uh, statutory dedication of all auto repair part sales tax as both uh, Senate file 3081 and Senate file 3806 would do will, cre will create a more reliable and ongoing funding source to address our critical transportation needs. Uh, they will provide investments that make a better life for millions of Minnesotans, will create and maintain thousands of good paying jobs, and fuel uh, our future economic growth. Uh, thank you for your time. Are there any questions for this testifier? Thank you. Right, thank you. Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. And we'll move on. We have five individuals on the testifiers list for uh, 3086 starting. Uh, with Margaret Donahoe. She is online. Please unmute yourself and identify yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Margaret Donahoe. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Transportation Alliance. We are a statewide coalition of both private and public sector organizations, including counties, cities, townships, uh, contractors, labor unions, transit, rail, ports, um, kind of all of the above. And uh, we are here uh, to support both Senator Newman's and Senator Howe's legislation to fully dedicate the sales tax on auto repair parts. Uh, we believe that this is the right time to finish the job and get this revenue dedicated. Uh, just as we worked back in 2006 to get the motor vehicle sales tax fully dedicated to transportation after many years of that being partially dedicated to transportation. We think this is an important time because of the need for additional funds to match the federal funds from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, as you've heard. Um, and because directing money to the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund will not only allow MnDOT to match federal funds, but will also help counties, cities, and townships as they struggle to meet their transportation needs. Um, and also, if they want to apply directly for federal funds, um, this would really help them as well in terms of having those matching dollars. Um, so we uh, really appreciate uh, both of these bills, uh, the, actual, the, the exact distribution of, of how uh, this ends up, we will um, wait to see. But we do know that the dollar amounts involved here with the dedication of the sales tax on auto parts is very similar to what the governor is recommending in his supplemental budget uh, recommendation to uh, direct, direct more uh, general fund dollars into the highway user tax distribution fund for the purpose of matching uh, federal funds. Um, so the impact on the general fund is very similar and with a big surplus, uh, this does seem like the right time to finally get this done. Um, so again, we know that all jurisdictions are underfunded, as the chair mentioned, and we do need dedicated funding. Uh, having a statutory dedication as opposed to one-time money makes a big difference in terms of being able to plan and deliver uh, multi-year transportation projects. 
So again, thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of both of these bills, and I'm happy to take any questions. Are there any questions for this testifier? Seeing none, thank you. And we move to the next testifier online again, Jeff Kruger. Please unmute yourself, identify yourself for the record, and begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jeff Krieger, and I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Association of Townships. <laughs> Matt represents the Minnesota's 1,780 townships and has over 900,000 residents, which is approximately 17% of the state's population. The Minnesota Association of Townships strongly supports Senate File 3086, as it dedicates 100% of auto parts sales tax revenues to roads and bridges. Townships have approximately 55,000 miles of roads, which is 39% of all Minnesota roads, and more than any other single level road authority in the state. Road and bridge expenditures are far and away the largest expense for townships at a cost of over $229 million per year. While Barry's township, township, my personal township, Newmarket Township in Scott County, we spend over 70% of our budget maintaining gravel and paved roads. Statewide, we know current spending is insufficient to meet the increased demand placed on township infrastructure. With a large state budget surplus, which is soon to grow even larger, Matt hopes that this can finally be the year to get the $20 million of ongoing and dedicated funding in, that townships need to just maintain the current 55,000 miles of township roads. In this specific proposal, 12% would be dedicated to the town road account. Based on auto parts sales tax estimates from the November 2021 forecast, 12% of revenues equals about $37.7 million in fiscal year 2023, $38.9 million in fiscal year 2024, and $40.4 million in fiscal year 2025. Meaning this proposal would be the shot in the arm for what townships have been asking for to meet transportation needs. If you look at our neighbors to the east, Wisconsin towns have 60,000 miles of roads to maintain and they will receive approximately $160 million in state funding for this year alone. That's three times what Minnesota townships currently receive in state funding. We want to personally thank Senator Howell for bringing this bill forward and to Senator Newman for his championship of this issue over the years as well. The time is right with bipartisan support for the concept of dedicating these funds for township roads and other local governments in need. Thank you members of the committee for your service to Minnesota and your leadership on transportation funding. We look forward to our continued partnership. I'm happy to stand for any questions. Are there any questions for this testifier? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. And we have three additional testifiers here in the, uh, in the room. First one is Cap O'Rourke. Please identify yourself for the record and begin your testimony. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Cap O'Rourke. I'm here uh, on behalf of the Minnesota Association of Small Cities. We represent uh, the over 700 cities across the state of Minnesota with populations of under 5,000. Uh, the Minnesota Small Cities currently are the only local government entities that do not have any dedicated funding for their local roads. Since uh, 2013, we had created a Small City Assistance Fund Unfortunately, the funding for that fund has been uh, sporadic and sparse at best. Uh, since, the, uh, since 2013, we have had a total of $45 million invested, which comes out to uh, about $5 million per year. Uh, and that's about, comes out to less than about $8,000 per city to fix roads. $8,000 to do any sort of road maintenance uh, at this time is not going to get you f very far. And for most of our cities, it uh, lets them with just being able to patch up some small potholes. I want to thank uh, Senators Newman and Senators Howe for bringing both these pieces of legislation forward. Uh, Senator Newman has a really great idea in dedicating the car part sales tax uh, to the transportation, and Senator Howe made it just a little bit better by peeling off some and dedicating it for the townships and small cities. Um, our small cities will, this bill will not only dedicate 35, over $35 million to our cities, it'll allow our cities to start to plan on how to use these transportation dollars 
dollars and really tackle some of their backlog of issues that they have seen as far as um, roads and helping out their local businesses survive. So we would like to fully put our full support behind this bill. Um, and please, if you do do the sales tax, make sure that you have some money going to townships and small cities. Thank you. Questions for this testifier? Senator Kiffmeyer. Mr. Chair, I just put my hand up. I'm going to wait till all the testifiers oh, are done. Okay. I'll put you on the list. Are there any questions for the testifier? <clears throat> Seeing none, thank you, sir. Uh, additional testifier, Shane Zart. Please identify yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Yeah, so thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Shane Zart with the firm Flaherty and Hood and represent the Coalition of Utility, or excuse me, the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities, um, a, uh, an organization of 110 cities all located outside of the, the seven county metro area. And I uh, just want to uh, echo some of the other local government testifiers and, and maybe, again, testifying to one of those key distinctions between the two bills here and uh, the component of Senator Howe's bill that would invest significantly in the uh, uh, small cities assistance account. Uh, this is a, a top uh, priority for the, uh, the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. Um, we can hear continually from our uh, communities that a highlight of last year's bill was that one-time funding in the, the small uh, cities assistance account, and the only caveat that they offer to that is that it was one-time funding. So uh, sustainable, dedicated funding for that account uh, is uh, uh, something I think that uh, uh, can happen this year, and we, we urge you to, uh, to see that through to the finish line. Um, I will note that uh, you know we've, our organization has been one in the past that's had some concerns about uh, proposals that would redirect certain uh, general fund money to transportation, especially when uh, some of uh, the constitutional uh, amendment proposals that have come forward in the past. And, um, and those have been for good reason at times. So a lot of our community leaders have led their communities through recessions and difficult times for the state general fund that uh, where they've seen cuts to local government aid and things that result. And, and I, I can't say that those co concerns have alleviated completely, but I will say with the state on solid fiscal footing, with uh, infrastructure putting pressure on local budgets themselves, uh, other efforts to increase transportation of revenue is coming up short, and uh, the fact that the level of investment in small city streets proposed in Senator Howe's bill would be historic. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a, a good time to move this forward, and, and we can finally stop coming here and pointing out that small cities are the, one, the only ones that don't get a dedicated stream of revenue. So thank you very much for the opportunity to testify, and, and we hope we can get it done this year. Are there any questions for this testifier? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Final uh, testifier on the list is Ann Finn. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, oh, you're good online. afternoon. Uh, my name is Ann Finn and I represent the League of Minnesota Cities. We are in a, a statewide association of 837 of Minnesota's 854 cities. Um, all of the testimony that I prepared today is very consistent with what you just heard from the other city groups, so I won't repeat all of that. Um, the two points I would leave with you are that you know, the League does a lot to help cities with uh, local budgets, and each year we get calls from city officials in our smaller cities asking if they can count on small cities assistance money um, in future years, and we have to tell them that we're not sure. So this bill would go a long way toward providing some certainty around that element of local budgets. And then the other point I wanted to make that I don't think has come up yet is that um, all of our cities um, are responsible for cost participation um, when it comes to county and state projects. And having these dollars available um, from the small cities assistance account would help our cities um, be good partners with the county, counties and state on these projects while not having to divert money off of their own systems. So this would be a wonderful tool if we could uh, keep it into the future and pass this legislation. So um, in short, the league supports Senate File 3086, and I will stop there. Thank you, members. Are there any questions for this testifier? Seeing none, are there any other individuals in the room that wish to testify on either one of these two bills? Seeing none, then we can go to questions from members as well as any amendments. I guess I'll start with one question I have to either one of you. Um, 
looks to me that we're talking about $160 million a year, roughly in some cases. It's certainly north of $150 million that would be added to the HUDT um, question. Do you have any concerns that add a significant increase, either one of you, uh, a, with a significant increase in the amount of money available for projects? that this could cause an inflationary effect, that we will have a lot more money in the system with the same number of contractors where, and I guess it could have been something I asked the contractors when they were here, that if you have a lot more money and the same number of contractors, that the prices for these projects could be artificially inflated as a result of having so much more money available and the contracts could be more rare and less contractors available to do more projects. Is there any fear of that inflationary pro uh, infl inflationary pressure? Senator Newman. Mr. Chairman, um, I think that, that perhaps uh, the contractors themselves would be in a better position to answer that question. And uh, I'd maybe invite uh, uh, one of them to come forward and, and talk about that. but. Uh, my feeling would be on the whole is no, I would not be concerned about that. Uh, there are uh, so many projects in Minnesota, both in terms of roads and bridges that need attention, uh, that um, uh, I, I really believe that uh, the business owners and the, the trades are going to be able to handle this issue fairly and, uh, and uh, do what is really best for the people in the state of Minnesota. But uh, uh, perhaps we could have uh, someone from the uh, construction industry come forward. Mr. Workey moved himself to the front of the room. Please state your name, and uh, if you need me to repeat the question, I can. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, um, members, Tim Workey, representing the Associated General Contractors. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe I understand the question. It doesn't lend itself to a, a real easy answer other than market dynamics being what they are. Um, there is always ebb and flow um, in uh, the bidding environment and the capacity in the industry to manage the level of work. Um, as I think we testified here um, as a United Industry with uh, uh, employers and labor, um, we feel that we, we would be able to effectively and efficiently deliver the work. I can tell you from past experience, uh, there is evidence if you want to really dig into the, to the data to go to the department's uh, MnDOT's um, uh, bid letting historical archives and you'll see that over time the industry has consistently delivered a very competitive market advantage uh, in terms of looking at what an engineer's estimate for a particular scope of work might be and then what the competitive market delivers. And um, consistently when that is summed year over year, we've seen uh, multiple hundreds of millions of dollars where the industry's competitive nature has, um, has delivered better value than what the estimate for the projects have been. So the, the answer, I believe, Mr. Chair, is that even with additional investments, the industry is still going to be exceedingly competitive and will be able to, to deliver um, good value for taxpayers. Thank you, Mr. Workey. I, it, I, I get concerned that when government starts putting more and more money into a system that there could be more um, issues with capacity. I think you defined it well as that the capacity may not change but more money in the system could cause an inflationary effect and we would actually get less bang for our buck. But it seems to me you said that's l unlikely to happen. I just want to make sure we're getting the best value we can for the dollar, uh, as everyone I'm sure in this committee believes. So with that, we have a number of members on the, uh, on the question list. Uh, Senator Kiffmeyer is first up. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I really appreciate this bill and totally support it. I'm very excited about it. I think the value just isn't in the dollars, but also the sustainable dollars. People can now plan. And a variety of small projects that often uh, don't or other things, now at least you're able to have that uh, ability. And seeing that uh, because of the cap of dollars, 
Uh, the percentage actually is decreasing over the years. But probably one of the biggest things is when I became a member of the Transportation Committee about 10 years ago, one of the things that struck me is having this chart, and as a matter of fact, it's, it's here today in front of us again, and you come to really like this chart because it explains uh, things, but um, the biggest thing is the box in the middle, uh, $2.6 billion of highway user tax distribution fund uh, on an annual basis for highway purposes, constitutionally dedicated, and how valuable that is. Uh, but the sources of the revenues are gas tax, tab fees, MV sales tax, other taxes, so on, like auto parts, rental, I mean, a variety of things. It goes into that account. So that's a substantial amount of money. But in general, property taxes locally also cover roads and bridges. And so I see some of the money that is here and absolutely support townships and small cities, everybody who's paid into the sales tax ought to get a portion of it on a steady basis. So I'm looking forward to that. My question, though, is probably better for our fiscal analysts, possibly. I was wondering, do we have as revenue sources of what goes in for roads and bridges, so we have state level things going on, but do we have any idea of, or can we figure out what percent of local property taxes, county, city, township, go into roads and bridges? Ms. Boyd, that might be a research question that we <laughs> take some time on, but Ms. Boyd? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Kiffmeyer. That's a very good question, and I don't have those numbers ready, but we can certainly get that for you for the committee as well. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it's really important to recognize that when people take a look, I mean, you were here in the state level and you hear this number, uh, it is definitely a big number. But if you add to that city, county, and townships of local property taxpayers that are not gas tax driven, that are not fuel source driven, but are local property taxes, um, I think it's important to have a full picture of what goes into roads and bridges. Nonetheless, the state and what they do, we're talking about billions here. And so um, I would just like to have an answer to that. And I understand, Mr. Chair, that that takes a little bit more time. I uh, appreciate looking forward to that as we progress in our work in the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks to the uh, both authors of the bill. I am fully supportive. I'm co-authors on both of them. I want to thank both of them uh, for having me on the bills. And again, going back to last year with the amendment, uh, splitting some dedicated funds to townships and small cities, I think is very, very important. Um, and, and this, both of these bills give money all across Minnesota to roads and bridges, which we all know, all need, uh, know need funding. Um, some great points made, and uh, Senator Osmick, I can uh, share the same concern with you over the inflationary factors, uh, but I think the dedicated uh, portion of this uh, alleviates some of that, and especially in Senator Howe's bill, because there's so many road contractors that are different, that, that uh, can work on gravel roads and township roads uh, that are different than the, the heavy users on highway and the bigger highway users, one uh, construction contractors. Uh, this dedicated fund will uh, take those bumps out I have I've been involved with some road construction uh, contractors in my business and in, in uh, my other job. And I know if there's a large influx of money in one year, then yes, you, you typically seem to, to pay a lot higher for some of those projects. Uh, as contractors are busy, they bid higher. If they get it, they get it. Uh, but actually dedicating those funds on a year by year basis allows contractors to ramp up and uh, hire more employees. Uh, maybe see some new businesses come out of this because you're seeing dedicated funds. I know from a background in city uh, to be able to plan for things. I have a capital improvement plan for these townships and these small cities. If they know that money is coming, it's so much more valuable to them to have that capital improvement plan uh, to plan for what they need to do in these small cities. Uh, just so important. Uh, I know uh, the, our uh, board or our uh, committee is very well rounded, but. Uh, for those of those uh, uh, committee members that are not out in rural Minnesota and see the township roads, please take a, a drive out and see some of those township roads and small cities. Uh, what those cities need uh, for money is just so important. And small cities are, you know, they're working on wastewater and things like that. All their budgets are very uh, full of things they have to spend money on. So to have a dedicated fund uh, for small cities 
and uh, townships are just so important. So I want to thank again both authors. I don't want to reiterate anymore. I wish I could be there in person because uh, this is very, very uh, close to what I'm, I've been pushing for for several years. So uh, again, with a $7.7 .7 billion surplus this year, I think it's a great year to get this uh, enacted and uh, make sure that our, our cities, uh, small cities and townships have this dedicated funding uh, to help every uh, Minnesotan uh, in the state. So thank you again for the time. Uh, thanks to all our testifiers. You did a great job at uh, expanding what we need to do in the state. Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, in, you know, in our history, we have tried and tried and tried to get more uh, funding for transportation. And one of the things that I know I worked on with the League of Minnesota Cities was trying to get uh, uh, street improvement districts that young, that small cities uh, could dedicate for their own locations. But we, we just couldn't get that through the constitutional challenges. Um, there isn't anything that I disagree with on all the testifiers about the need. We have a huge need and that hasn't changed. But what has changed now, and that brings me concern, is that we have not um, actually acknowledged where this money is coming from. The money is coming from the piggy bank that funds the rest of the budget. Now, great that we have a uh, forecasted uh, uh, surplus. That makes it easy to get money out of the surplus. But uh, what if that goes away? Uh, Will this be the first money that the uh, the future administration will go after and will take it out of that that same account that we're now putting it into? So it's not it's not permanently dedicated. It's dedicated as long as it's not used or it's not needed, but it, it will come out. And then the other concern I have is I'm, I'm certainly hoping that all of the testifiers are going to recognize and acknowledge that this is coming out of the piggy bank that funds our education, that funds our health care, that funds our veterans, crime and punishment, uh, the county program aid, and even local government aid wherever it's needed, and housing. These, these um, also these demands on the budget are going to be there after this uh, surplus is gone and maybe we rebalance the budget with a supplemental, all of that sort of thing. So we have to be cognizant that this is not something that is just a gift that's going to come out of the air and that we we can take it and use it for where we want without some some uh, collateral damage somewhere i could vote for this bill i like putting more into transportation and i'm i know that we're so be far behind on our transportation system here and uh, I, i'm i'm sorry i can't blame the civil engineers uh because they do what they can with what they're given. So I think, uh, um, Mr. Chair, uh, and uh, I guess I'm saying, Mr. Chair, the uh, uh, Senator Newman, I'm hoping that you're going to help us get, you know, replace the money that is going to be redirected out of those things that we need, because we can't cut back on the veterans, we can't cut back on education. We need to fund those things too. So thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, both of you, Mr. Chairs. Thank you. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, first of all, I want to thank all the testifiers for coming out today, uh, especially those that are here in person. It's nice to see uh, the Senate getting back to, to normal business as much as we can uh, and appreciate you know, the effort to get here. Uh, and, and I just want to congratulate both, uh, both authors on, on such a common sense bill that's been able to to get broad support. I can't recall when we've had contractors and laborers and uh, communities and, and uh, advocates all on the same page uh, around the need for this, uh, uh, for this bill. And, you know, I wish I could pull this into the Jobs Committee because I see this as, a, as, as really a jobs bill as well we, because we want every Minnesotan to be able to participate in the economy and, and, and be successful. Um, and this is really uh, removing barriers to investment or, or what we hear constantly is, is that the infrastructure is one of the barriers to investment in creating those jobs and, and making that investment uh, in the state. And I think this goes a long way to 
uh, moving that forward. Uh, you know, the, the other thing I was thinking of from a job standpoint was that, uh, Mr. Chair, you kind of brought up the, the increased demand. Well, what that's going to mean is, is we're going to need increased uh, people working those, those job sites. We're still 100,000 people short in our workforce from where we started in February of uh, 2020. 100,000 people no longer in the workforce that, that we'd like to get some of those back. And, and as I've talked to, the, uh, to folks, we need to replace the people who are retiring. And this is going to create those skilled construction jobs to help replace those tiring, retiring uh, members. So that's my comments. I guess my question and whether it's, um, you know, whether it's for cities or townships or, or Senator Howe, as I understood the math that you were putting forward, <laughs> we're putting about four and a half, five percent uh, into the small town account today. This would kick up the new money to about 12 percent. Can you help me understand how we came to that figure? Senator Howe. Well, I, I, I'm not quite sure exactly, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm not quite sure how we came to that conclusion, but we were trying to get about what, where the, the townships and the cities had been requesting the funds. And we thought about 12% would get us there. Uh, that, we, we kind of overshot that just a bit, but uh, I'm sure that they could use that. Uh, you know, as, as we work these bills forward, uh, that may change a bit, but uh, we, we kind of thought that 76% and 24% being split out were, was going to be about where we wanted to land. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and just maybe one other comment. And Senator Newman, maybe you can uh, verify my math on this. But um, we take very little out of the general fund to support our infrastructure. If I remember the, the stat you said one time, it was about five one hundredths of a, of a percent. And this seems to me to be a very good use of our of our funds. I mean, we as the state have have said that that having good solid infrastructure for commerce and safety are critical to our ability to 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 be successful as a state. <coughs> and uh, am I right on that? That that a very small amount of the general fund that using this money that's being generated off our highways and in, in, in some way is transportation related for auto parts and repairs um, is a good <laughs> use of funds rather than going out and, and creating a new, a new tax burden on uh, Minnesotans when we're already the fifth highest tax state in the nation? Senator Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt, you are absolutely correct <clears throat> that there's a very small amount of money that comes out of the general fund. Uh, and I believe the correct percentage is 0.5%. And of that 0.5%, Ms. Boyd would have to help me, but it's an even smaller percentage of that 0.5% that goes into roads and bridges. I don't remember what that number is, uh, uh, Ms. Boyd may, but it is a very small percentage as compared to uh, other areas that we fund out of the general fund, like education, uh, health and human services and those type of things, properly so. But the transportation system in Minnesota is almost exclusively, almost exclusively funded by user fees and that are the people that drive. And this redirection of auto part sales tax is really simply, uh, you know, part of that uh, user fee because I, I doubt very much that people who take transit go in and buy auto parts sales. So uh, I agree with you, Senator Pratt, and, uh, and it's just something that is absolutely necessary that we recognize that we are not properly funding transportation needs in the state of Minnesota. Senator Dibble. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I won't repeat uh, much of what Senator Carlson um, said, other than to say um, I do agree with all of the testimony that was provided. Um, the need was articulated well, um, and I agree very strongly with the sentiment that uh, it needs to be a dedicated, reliable, um, and uh, you know, long-term 
in nature and because it's not constitutionally dedicated, <clears throat> um, it is, you know, this sort of, of resource um, is at some risk in future budgetary years when other priorities for the general fund emerge around things like investment in public education and healthcare and the like. Um, I'll just add to that that um, uh, while this is very definitely a significant, uh, a substantial amount of money, I think an additional approximately $600 million per biennium uh, and a growing source, um, I just want to remind us that this doesn't do the job. It doesn't complete the job. Uh, the numbers that we are most familiar with were those that were turned into us through the work and the analysis done by the Transportation Finance Advisory Committee, the TFAC report of, of a few years ago. <clears throat> and from that, we know that um, just to maintain the enterprise, if you will, the infrastructure we have just for state highways alone, just to, just to keep up with what we have in, in a state of good repair, um, we would need an additional $600 million uh, per year, a little less because we've devoted some, some money um, from this and, and others. Um, but that's, that's just for the roadway infrastructure um, that we own as a state. Uh, local units, uh, townships, counties, um, cities of all sizes uh, would require another $900 million. So it's a lot of money um, that we need to put into our roadway system just to keep up with what we have, which is pretty good. We have the sixth or actually now, I think the fifth largest roadway system on a per capita, or not per capita, um, uh, in actual real miles. Um, uh, so, so we have inherited a fantastic <coughs> transportation mobility infrastructure. I think it has a lot to do with why our state is so successful, um, but it's, you know, it's old and, uh, and we have a lot more to do. So I just worry about, um, you know, do, you know, if, if this were to pass, then we think we, we've got the job done um, and we haven't. I mean, certainly we've been successful in these one-off bills with one-time appropriations and bonding dollars, but um, you know, that's, that's by its definition, not reliable, not sustained, not ongoing, um, can be very, very volatile. And I'll just finally add as my final um, per, uh, perspective uh, and, and uh, um, thought is to invite um, the chair uh, to a conversation with me to talk about having this very same conversation around transit, um, because we know that uh, in just a few years, we won't even have enough money to operate the current transit system that, that we have, um, just the buses, basically. Um, we've been able to put it off through spending our reserves and, and the federal come in, and we've seen the downturn in, in transit ridership. But uh, it's a pretty good guess that that ridership is going to come back. And there are a lot of people whose mobility needs simply are not being served um, by our transit system today. So um, we need to have this very same conversation with respect to just maintaining our existing transit system, particularly in the metro area. So, uh, but I will say for the record, without it hopefully introducing a whole new subject, I don't wanna raise a, a bunch of new dollars on a permanent basis and uh, plug it into the agency that operates our transit system as we know it today. So I'll just leave that hanging in the air for you for a later conversation. Uh, and I thank you for your time. Seeing no further hands being raised, uh, uh, Senator Johnson Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to emphasize uh, my agreement with the testifiers, as well as make a note that the civil engineers did not make the roads in bad condition. We're just assessing them. And by the way, a new report card is coming out. It's already been collected. Uh, we're not doing much better, but we are improving a little bit. And so um, I think all my colleagues, many of whom I know quite well, came to testify today uh, for advocating for our roads and I thank Senator Newman and Senator Howe for this legislation. Thank you. Seeing no further hands being raised, I just <clears throat> want to make one comment and we'll go for closing comments. Uh, members, um, we all know there's only one uh, true way to guarantee that what we do in this legislature is not going to be undone next year and the year after that and the year after that. It's a constitutional dedication. So anything we do can always be manipulated and changed without our permission. Uh, that's just how representative government works. Um, I would hope that they wouldn't remove it. However, the next legislature has every right to change priorities if they care to. We're just doing what we can to move forward 
in a rational, thoughtful way to try and deal with the situation without having to go to a new tax. So with that, uh, Senator Newman, closing comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd uh, first of all like to uh, bring to the members' uh, attention specifically two of the documents that are in your packet, one of which Senator Kiffmeyer's already uh, uh, mentioned, and that is this sheet. I ask that it be put in your packet just to help you understand how the money flows uh, uh, from the three sources and into the HUTDF. The other document I wanted to, to, to show folks was this chart that was prepared by uh, our Senate Transportation Fiscal Analyst to try and illustrate for you a little bit how the actual numbers work. <clears throat> um, with respect to Senator Dibble's comments, uh, I agree with Senator Dibble that, uh, yes, there is some risk to uh, these funds. Uh, but there is, of course, risk to all of the funds, and it will be up to the future legislatures as to what they want to do with uh, uh, these funds, if anything. Uh, uh, I also agree with Senator Dibble that this is a start, but it is not enough. Uh, I have already uh, uh, mentioned that a number of times, that, uh, yeah, this is a lot of money, but transportation infrastructure is horribly expensive. And so Senator Dibble is correct. Uh, this won't fix the problem, but I, do, I really believe that it is a step in the right direction and it's going to help. Uh, finally, with respect to Senator Dibble's comment regarding uh, transit, uh, I again agree with him. Transit is something that we have to address, uh, and it is uh, vitally important, particularly to the people in the metropolitan area that they have available to them uh, proper, adequate transportation if they don't drive. And um, the one thing that I would say is, yeah, there is a lot of money that is necessary for transit, but there's also an awful lot of money that, in my estimation, is being wasted uh, with the light rail system, in particular, Southwest Light Rail. Uh, so I'm happy to have that conversation with Senator Dibble because I do think that he is right on those three points. Uh, finally, I want to say that uh, I, want to, I want to thank uh, the testifiers that have come in and testified uh, in favor of this bill, both virtually, but more specifically the testifiers that actually came here uh, on a really a, an unpleasant weather day and, uh, and testified. I also want to say I'm really happy to see some people back in our Senate transportation committee hearing. Uh, it, it's, it's overdue, and I'm very happy to see that have, has happened. But insofar as these testifiers are, uh, testifiers are concerned, I would ask the committee members, please note the diversity of who is in favor of this, uh, this bill and Senator Howe's bill. We have got uh, the construction trades that are here, and they are concerned not only for the state of Minnesota, but they're concerned about the fact that this is a jobs bill for them. And Senator Pratt, you want to pull this bill into jobs, be more than happy to come in and we'll talk about it, because you're right, this is a jobs bill. Uh, we have got business interests that are in favor of this bill, and justifiably so, because it will help the economy in terms of the businesses in Minnesota. We have uh, local units of government that have stepped forward and said, this is really a good idea, and we support these bills. And then finally, there are special interest groups that are particularly interested in transportation infrastructure, and they support this, this bill. So uh, I just want to make sure that we uh, acknowledge the wide variety of uh, folks that are in favor of moving forward with this bill. With that, uh, Senator Osmick, I do have a motion, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, whenever you are ready. Uh, <clears throat> Senator Newman moves that Senate File 3081 do pass this body and be re-referred re to the Committee on Taxes. Is there any further discussion? That is, Mr. Chairman, my motion, uh, and I would request a roll call vote. Roll call is requested. Roll call is granted. To Senate File 3081, the clerk will take the roll. Chair Newman. Aye. 
Vice Chair Jasinski. Aye. Senator Dibble. Yes. Senator Carlson. Yes. Senator Coleman. Aye. Senator Howe. Aye. Senator Johnson Stewart. Yes. Senator Kent. Senator Kiffmeyer. Aye. Senator McEwen. Aye. Senator Osmick. Aye. Senator Pratt. Aye. Senator Kent. With a vote of 12 ayes and no nays with one absent, the motion does prevail and the bill is moved to taxes. Senator uh, Howe, for your closing comments. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm not going to reiterate everything that uh, Senator Newman uh, has already stated. <clears throat> uh, I will say, though, that I have to give credit to Senator Jasinski for his amendment last year to uh, establish that small cities account and this small road account that was a great idea and it, it uh, differentiates uh, Senator Newman's bill and and uh, my bill I I will say that if you've gone out and been in the rural communities in the small cities if you've gone out and tried to drive down some of the township roads that uh, have a minimum maintenance sign on them I will I will tell you that that isn't a minimum maintenance road, that's a no maintenance road. And uh, we can't expect our townships to fix those roads and actually make them passable unless we fund them. So I think this is a very important piece uh, to, to get us there. And with that, Mr. Chair, uh, I, uh, I'll make a motion. Senator Howe moves that Senate File 3086 to pass this committee and be re-referred to the Committee on Taxes. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the Oh, well, Mr. Chair, could we do a roll call on that, a request for roll call? I wondered My if that's what that was. Uh, roll call is requested, roll call granted. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Newman. Aye. Vice Chair Jasinski? Aye. <coughs> Senator Dibble? Aye. Senator Carlson? Aye. Senator Coleman? Aye. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Johnson Stewart? Aye. Senator Kent? Senator Kiffmeyer? Aye. Senator McEwen? Aye. Senator Osmick? Aye. Senator Pratt? Aye. Senator Kent? With a vote of 11 ayes, no nays, and one absence, the bill is uh, does pass and is referred to the uh, Committee on Taxes. And for the, rec for the record, uh, the previous vote was also 11, 0, and one absence. Uh, I miscounted. So uh, both of you are on your way to taxes. We have one additional bill, Senator Howe. Uh, we have about five minutes, plus or minus. We might have a few minutes to go a little long. Senate file 1602, Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senate file uh, 1602 basically uh, imposes a fuel tax on the electricity used for charging electric vehicles. And Mr. Chair, I'd like to move the A2 amendment. It is a delete all amendment. Senator Howe moves the A2 amendment. It is an author's amendment. This is the primary committee of jurisdiction. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion does prevail. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, just to make this quick, what this does is it emulates what we currently do with our liquid fuel and our other fuels for motor vehicles. This treats electricity as a motor fuel and basically collects this at the utility that's providing the electricity to charge the electric vehicles. Uh, it does require uh, 
if you purchase a vehicle to notify the uh, electric vehicle that you notify the electric utility that you're going to charge this thing from uh, that you have purchased an a, a electric uh, vehicle. So with that, Mr. Chair, in the essence of time, I'll go to testifiers. Very well. Uh, so so uh, members, the bill in front of us uh, does have implications that we'll send it to the Committee on Energy and Utilities. Um, you may want to constrain yourself to the tax itself as opposed to asking questions regarding uh, utilities and their abilities. I didn't mean to rhyme, but uh, those type of questions are going to be ones that will be taken up in the Committee on Energy and Utilities. Um, we, you know, we don't have a lot of time, but I just wanted to make that point. Um, and they are not, there are not, Excel Energy and other utilities, I don't believe are in the room, so they wouldn't be, we wouldn't be able to answer those questions anyway. So. And we have been in a discussion with them, Mr. Chair, and, mm -hmm. and uh, this also does repeal the surcharge that currently gets charged to the electric vehicles. The 75 bucks a year. Yes. So uh, with that, we have two testifiers. First on the list is Margaret Donahoe. Please unmute yourself and introduce yourself for the record. Begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, I'm Margaret Donahoe, director of the Minnesota Transportation Alliance. Um, we really want to thank Senator Howe. Um, this is a really innovative approach. Um, 30 states currently do charge an electric vehicle fee to compensate for the loss of revenue from a fuel tax. And so lots of states are recognizing that this will be an issue as more and more electric vehicles are purchased and the revenue is not collected from the traditional gas tax. Um, but as Senator Howe mentioned, all the other alternative fuels in Minnesota are taxed. And so treating electricity this way uh, will help uh, with making sure that we don't lose revenue into the highway trust fund. And because we're taxing the fuel as opposed to an additional fee, it does fit the constitutional language uh, requiring the revenue to be deposited in the highway user tax distribution fund, which we think is really important. Um, because as you've heard many times, uh, that constitutional dedication, that stability is really, really important. Um, so again, we wanna thank Senator Howe and stand for any questions you might have. Are there any questions for this testifier? Seeing no hands, thank you. Uh, Senator Kiffmeyer has one, but not now, right? She'll be doing that at the end, so she's first up after we get through the testifiers. Uh, second and final testifier on the list is Tim Sexton. Yeah, thank you, Chair. For the record, my name is Tim Sexton. I serve as Assistant Commissioner for, uh, at the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Um, and just first of all, I want to as an agency, we really want to thank this committee, Chair Newman and Senator Howe, for the continued recognition of the critical need to fund transportation needs in Minnesota. Um, you know, as vehicles become more fuel efficient and electric vehicles begin to make up a larger percent of all vehicles in Minnesota, we recognize and support the need to explore how these market changes will impact current and future transportation funding needs. And while this is a national issue, we agree that this is a worthwhile discussion and I'd appreciate the legislature being proactive and identifying options now to protect transportation revenue in the future. Um, you know, currently electric vehicles make up less than 1% of all registered vehicles in Minnesota, but that's expected to change along with their financial contribution as EV prices decrease and get closer to, to parity with their internal combustion engine counterparts. Um, and so as that happens, their electric vehicle's contribution to transportation will also decrease. Um, currently, we have done evaluation of their contribution and with the $75 fee, um, EVs actually contribute more um, to transportation revenues. However, again, that we recognize that will likely change. Um, and you know, combined with higher fuel efficiency for all cars and trucks, um, these, these market forces really have the potential to to increase the existing funding challenges to our system beyond the gaps that exist today. So just um, for means of consideration, um, you know, we would respectfully suggest that this committee considers a work group that would include state agencies, external stakeholders like utilities and state legislators to work together to identify strategies to address the potential for decreasing gas tax revenue in the future due to expected increases in electric vehicles 
and the overall increases in fuel efficiency of all cars and trucks in Minnesota, as both will have impacts to gas tax revenues. So we continue to be really grateful for your su support um, of the agency and state transportation funding. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify and happy to stand for the questions. Are there any questions for this testifier? To Senator Dibble, you raised your hand. Is that to the testifier or after Senator Kiffmeyer? After Senator Kiffmeyer, thank you. Mr. Very Chair. good. Any, any questions for that testifier? Seeing none, Senator Kiffmeyer is first on my list. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So one of the things I like about Senator Howe's bill is that it's more fair to the electric vehicles because the more, con more you consume the electricity, which is like gas, um, the more you pay, and I think that's a very fair issue for them. Question I have for you, though, Senator Howe. Um, when we talk about the wear and tear on our roads and bridges, could you talk a little bit about electric vehicles and not just the fuel they use, but also how that impacts roads and bridges? Senator Howe. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Kiffmeyer. The, normally, if you, if you compare the, the weight of an electric vehicle to its uh, gas-powered counterpart, you'll find that the electric vehicles normally weigh more, and usually the more weight you put on, a, on the road network, usually that causes more wear and tear. Uh, usually in the, in the smaller vehicles like this, it, it's probably not a, a huge effect, but currently right now, uh, to me, right now the, the surcharge piece, we only get the folks that live in Minnesota, where when we get all these charging stations out there that are coming, uh, we'll be able to collect this fuel tax on everyone that comes into our state and plugs in. And so that is the real benefit of this, that we're not going over after just Minnesotans. We will distribute this and we'll get this from everyone that drives into our state that's driving an electric vehicle. Thank Senator you, Kiffmeyer. Mr. Chair. That's good information. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just be very quick. Um, a lot of my issues and concerns probably are more appropriate for the Energy Committee. Um, so. Um, uh, hopefully um, this bill will get a little more time uh, to be heard and worked through with questions and, and hopefully some some remedies to those questions there um, because I think there are a lot of technical problems with the bill um, and I, I don't think that it's it's frankly very well thought through but I do have a question for uh, Senator Howe. Now, Senator Howe, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the 5.1 cents per kilowatt hour? How does that compare to what people pay in in gas tax, the average um, uh, automobile owner driver who who has a just a regularly fueled uh, gas fueled car, how does that compare? What uh, will level EV owner be paying? Senator Howe, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Dibble. It's actually an equivalent. It's uh, we went through the process to try to get it as exact as we could to be an equivalent to the 28 and a half cents that uh, the other fuels pay currently. Senator Dibble. Thanks, that's, that's good information. I, I had been told it was a little bit more, but not that much more. I think the average uh, person pays a little over $200 per year in gas tax. And I think this is uh, up closer to um, uh, $300, not a huge difference, but but I was just curious how, how you'd come up with that amount. And then, um, Finally, uh, uh, my only other question is, I, I appreciate the exemptions. Um, I think there might be some more exemptions that you would want to consider like school buses and, and others. Um, so just wanted to call attention to that, to that question and, and that issue. Um, and, and then just Mr. Chair, I'll just finally say, um, uh, you know, it's gonna be, this is maybe an issue more for the, the energy committee, but it's gonna be hard to figure out you know, unless we, you know, separately meter these particular uh, outlets at people's homes, you know, if someone is actually paying uh, the, the electricity tax that they need to, a lot of questions about if that's going to be necessary and who's going to pay for that. Um, but also, um, you know, I think ultimately, and, you know, Senator Drzezinski and I uh, agree on this, um, really looking at, you know, some form of acknowledgement that wear and tear on our roads should should be uh, priced uh, in terms of how much folks pay for for their um, use of the roads 
Um, this is an approximation of that. Even fuel tax is just approximation of, of a distance oriented uh, tax, but that's highly variable based on fuel efficiency and how much someone drives, et cetera. Um, so I don't think this actually is, is, is necessarily quite the solution, but I've talked about you know, the fact that we need to tax the, the energy source for all kinds of fuels. So I don't necessarily think it's, we're in the totally wrong headed. Um, I just think this bill probably needs a little more thought and a little more work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Dibble. The exemptions actually come exactly out of the gas, current gas tax bill. So it's, it's, it's equivalent to, we tried to make it as equivalent as we could to what we currently tax and what we currently exempt. Uh, for to one of Senator Dibble's points, and because of my previous history on that particular committee, um, a lot of charger people who are charging uh, right now do have meters or some way to measure the amount of juice that goes in. Uh, in many cases, they also have uh, a certain amount of. I think there's some deduct that's involved, but it's been a while since I've. Uh, talked with Excel and, and the munis and co-ops about it, but I think uh, that is an interesting point is that how are we going to get people if they just plug it into a wall outlet and that's the slowest charge. It's not, you know, there's various methodologies, methodologies for charging a separate inbound structure that you could actually do the metering on and we'll charge it faster, but you can still plug it into a wall outlet. It's just going to charge very, very slow. Uh, Senator Newman. Senator Newman. <laughs> I'm, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm over here pushing buttons. Uh, I just wanted to point out just a, a corollary to the uh, to the question of you know how do we uh, enforce this? How do we uh, determine whether or not people are in fact paying uh, the the tax due on charging their vehicles? Um, for example, there, there is uh, uh, very prevalent in outstate Minnesota uh, what they call off-road diesel, uh, which, uh, on which a sales tax is paid, but the, uh, the gas tax is not paid on. There's really nothing that prevents uh, individuals who are driving a diesel pickup, for instance, to, uh, to, from stopping in and, and uh, putting in some ruby red into their, into their diesel. Uh, but it's illegal. And so I, you know, it is a, a point well taken uh, that there may be an enforcement uh, issue, but on the whole, uh, I really think that uh, if people are required to pay this and report it, I think that they are going to do so because otherwise uh, it's an illegal act. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Closing comments, Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, a lot of good comments. And I, I and to uh, respect to Senator Dibble's comments, this is not a, a, a finished product. It's a it's a work in progress. There's a lot of discussion to go on, but unless we have that discussion uh, and we work together on this, uh, we will be far behind the eight ball when all those charging stations get in, put in place and we had, do not have the infrastructure to collect the appropriate gas tax. So, Mr. Chair, I would ask for a roll call vote. Roll call is requested. Roll call is granted. Senator Howe moves Senate File 1602 do pass as amended from this body and be re-referred to the, Ener the Committee on Energy and Utilities. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll. Chair Newman. Aye. Vice Chair Jasinski. Aye. Senator Dibble. No. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Coleman? Aye. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Johnson Stewart? Yes. Senator Kent? Senator Kiffmeyer? Aye. Senator McEwen? No. Senator Osmick? Aye. Senator Pratt? Aye. Senator Kent. Yes. 
by a vote of eight to three with one absence. The motion does prevail. This, the a bill is sent to the Committee on Energy and Utilities. Members, that does complete our agenda for the day, and this, this uh, committee is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>